There's this idea that Bitcoiners push a lot, that right now it is a generational wealth creation opportunity to buy Bitcoin. That in the future, they believe this is absolutely gonna happen, and I say it may happen, that Bitcoin may become universally used as money. And if that takes place, then the price of Bitcoin compared to today's price in dollars will have to be much, much higher for Bitcoin to be used to denominate every transaction on earth. The total market cap of Bitcoin must be much higher to be able to absorb all those transactions. Therefore, it is wise to purchase at least a little bit of Bitcoin right now so that if that future does in fact happen, then you have created generational wealth for yourself. You have bought Bitcoin right now when it's early and when it is cheap. And in the future, you and your descendants will be rich, which begs the question, if you don't buy Bitcoin right now, are you leaving your descendants out to dry? Is it possible that right now all of the Bitcoin is being purchased? And given the fact that it has an absolute limited supply, are you potentially missing out and causing your descendants to have to live in a world where they don't have access to any of the money? Well, the answer to that is no, but I'm gonna take it a couple steps farther than that and show you why not only are your descendants not gonna be left out to dry, but in 100 years or 200 years, if Bitcoin becomes universally used as money, not only will your descendants not be left out to dry and they will have as much access to Bitcoin as they need, but also the people who are the richest people in 100 years or 200 years, assuming Bitcoin becomes universally used as money, are not going to be the descendants of the people who buy Bitcoin today. To understand why, first we have to look at the type of an economy that would exist built on top of a Bitcoin standard. And so for the rest of this video, we're assuming Bitcoin becomes universally used as money in the future. Money is one half of every single transaction. So when you go to work, when you buy something, when you go on a date, when you live in your house that you rent or your mortgage, your car payment, your gas, when you pay your taxes, when the government enacts any legislation they have to pay for, they have to send money, they have to pay for the enforcement of that legislation, all of that takes money. In fact, governments just have zero power without money because governments rely on a monopoly on violence in order to have any power whatsoever. And that requires requires paying people who use force. So money is a foundation of all human action. It is 50% of every exchange. For you and I to get our hands on money, we have to create value for somebody else. Basically what that means is we have to create something that somebody else wants badly enough to give us money for it. Most people go their entire lives and the only thing of value they have to give away is just their time. But the people who get the most wealthy over their lives are the ones who build skills and create enough value where they can provide that value to somebody else and somebody else gives them that amount of money for it. And typically that's going to be creating assets, creating companies. So you look at the richest people today and they have spent the majority of their time creating large companies, which is creating something that is valuable enough that they've sold that to other people, meaning they created something and then gave it to somebody else for that amount of money. But with governments, it's actually entirely different because the government never does, nor do they have have to create any sort of value in order to exchange it for money. They just have to tell you, hey, give me some money. And if you don't comply, then they use their monopoly on violence and the people who they pay to use force to put you in jail until you do comply. Further than that, if they don't want to go through that hassle, they can get even more money by just printing it out of thin air. This is something that is illegal for you and I because if everybody did it, then the money would become instantly worthless. But if only one economic actor, the government does this, then the money just slowly becomes worth less and less and less over time. This gives them the ability to pay for all their legislation and enforcing it in their monopoly on violence and enforce regulations that most people do not want. This is why sound money is a leash on government evil because they, number one, cannot produce any more supply of it by sheer will. They cannot just fire up the money printer to create more gold or to create more Bitcoin. This is why in the past, when money was gold or when gold was money, when the gold ran out, 
out, the wars stopped. The soldiers came home because the money stopped flowing. And when the soldiers aren't getting paid to be on the battlefield anymore, they're just gonna walk away. And that's exactly what used to happen. On top of that, having the money supply continually expand over time through uh, the inflation of the money supply, you have economic incentives flipped around. So people have to think more short term because prices are going up. You have the financialization of economies and all sorts of other problems that take place. And most, if not all, those would be stopped or even reversed under a new sound money standard like a Bitcoin standard. With a hard cap on limited supply of Bitcoin as the money supply, you would maximize the amount of economic freedom in most places. And because of the economic competition that would spring up, the certain places that decided not to allow economic freedom would quickly be outcompeted and then they would lose any of the wealth that they had, which was giving them the ability to impose those extra regulations, they'd be competed out of business basically. And so under a sound money standard, like a Bitcoin standard, if Bitcoin becomes universally used as money, we would experience global economic freedom, probably like we have never seen in global history. So that's the first part that is essential to understand. Bitcoin standard equals economic freedom basically. But first, a word from today's sponsor, I Trust Capital. Investors today face all sorts of new and unique risks. Invest in stocks and risky stock market crash. Invest in bonds and watch the value of those bonds drop as interest rates rise. Keep your money in cash and watch inflation eat away your purchasing power. Invest in crypto and watch frauds like Sam Bankman Freed steal all your money. This has many investors looking to alternative stores of value like gold and Bitcoin. The problem with this is that most investors are not able to access gold and Bitcoin. This is because most people have most of their assets tied up in their retirement accounts. And most retirement accounts do not allow you access to things like gold or silver or Bitcoin. This is where iTrust Capital comes in. iTrust Capital allows you to open up a new retirement account or even transfer an existing retirement account. Then you can purchase alternative stores of value with your retirement like gold, silver, and Bitcoin. In days like this where fraudulent platforms like FTX are collapsing and traditional banks like Silicon Valley Bank are failing from bank runs. I trust capital is still going strong because they do things the right way. You own your assets there. Your assets are always held off balance sheet and your accounts are never commingled with theirs. They partner with industry leaders like Kitco for their precious metals. And they're straightforward about how they keep your assets separate and safe. And if you use my my link in the description below, you will get $100 worth of Bitcoin just for signing up. The second thing we have to understand is what a system of economic freedom does to something called wealth mobility. Wealth mobility is the likelihood that your amount of wealth will move around throughout your life. So if you're born into complete poverty, you have absolutely nothing, you're in the bottom 1%. What are the chances that at some point in your life, you'll make it up to the top? 1%. In a system with a really high degree of economic mobility, then you have a high chance that you will be able to do something to get from the bottom 1% into the top 1%. This also means that if you're in a system with a high degree of wealth mobility, that if you're in that top 1%, then you actually still have a high chance of losing that spot and going down to the bottom 1%. A high degree of wealth mobility means people bounce around all the time and are never stuck in place. Now, it is true that when economists have studied different economies, different countries, different regions to look at what kind of wealth mobility exists, the less freedom a place has, the less wealth mobility they have as well. So you think about the places with the least amount of freedom on earth, like North Korea. If you're the dictator, you've got all the wealth, and that's not gonna change. If you're anybody else, you have no wealth, and that's not gonna change either. It's a pure caste class system, zero wealth mobility. On the other hand, if you look at somewhere like the United States, which historically has had a high degree of wealth mobility, they also have a fairly high degree of economic freedom compared to the rest of the world. Now, there's a transition between those two where you get something called an absorbing barrier. The first person that I learned about absorbing barriers from was Nassim Taleb. I believe it was in his book, Black Swan, but it may have been in uh, Anti-Fragile. 
fantastic books, by the way. An absorbing barrier would look like a sticky piece of tape at the very top of the wealth layer. So if you're at the bottom 1% and somehow you are able to make it up to the top 1%, you're stuck there. And now, because you've made it, you can't fall back down. Systems like this, they still have a high degree of wealth mobility, except for that top rung is basically always going to be the same people. For economies like this, you'd be looking at places like older countries like Western Europe that have some very, very wealthy families that preserve their wealth through many generations, and some of the places in the Middle East like to have built their wealth on oil and preserved it within the royal families. It's key to recognize here that the reason why these things happen is not because of freedom, is not because of free markets, it is because of the regulations and because of the government imposing these things that makes the incumbents a lot easier at maintaining and keeping their wealth away from everybody else. But the more economic freedom you have, the more chances you have for new competitors, for somebody with nothing to be agile and to take the right decisions and start taking market share away from the incumbents. Freedom to rise also means freedom for the top to fall. Okay, so now let's start putting these two things together. We have in the future, our hypothetical future where Bitcoin has become universally used as money. We have the most economically free world that we've ever had. That also means we have the most amount of wealth mobility on earth that we've ever had. Anybody who is born with nothing has a very high chance of being able to create a lot of wealth throughout their life and make it to the top. And somebody who has a lot of wealth, if they don't continue to take all the correct actions, they will lose that wealth. There are not systems in place that allow them to artificially impose their wealth preservation on others, keep competition away, or no more exploiting the system, passing down that wealth from generation to generation. And now you probably see where I'm going with this. The people who are buying Bitcoin today saying, hey, I'm gonna pass this down to my children, my grandchildren and my great-grandchildren and I'm gonna have generational wealth are missing the point. The only way that that Bitcoin that you're buying today is worth a ton of money in the future is if Bitcoin becomes universally used as money. And in that world, your descendants have the highest probability of losing all that wealth that you stored up for them. Now, here's the kicker. You also have to ask the final question then. Well, if it's not the people who are buying the Bitcoin today who are going to have the most wealth in the future, who is it? Well, what will Bitcoin be? It will not be a cryptocurrency. It will not be another asset class. It will not be something held in it. It'll just be money. So who are the people in the most free places on earth today who have most of the money, who have most of the wealth? It's not the people who bought the dollar in 1776 when America was started, <laughs> which means in the future, the people under a Bitcoin standard who are wealthiest are not going to be the people whose grandparents bought Bitcoin when Bitcoin was first created. It will be the same type of people who are the wealthiest people today under a dollar standard, which is the asset creators, the wealth creators, the value creators. Bitcoin will just be money. So what does it take to get more money? It takes creation of value, which is defined as I make something that somebody else wants badly enough to give me money for it. So in a hundred years and in 200 years, if we have a Bitcoin standard, the people who have the most Bitcoin, the wealthiest people on earth, will not be the descendants of the early Bitcoin buyers. Instead, they will be the entrepreneurs, the value creators, the company builders, the economic powerhouses who create the most value. Because at the end of the day, that's how money functions. It flows to the people who create the most value. It does not flow to the people or stick with the people whose grandparents bought it back in 2023. Now, don't get me wrong. I am all for having an allocation to Bitcoin because there is a chance that it goes up a lot in value if it becomes money in the future. Really, it's a binary outcome. A hundred years from now, Bitcoin in today's dollars will either be worth a million, $10 million per Bitcoin, or it'll be worth zero. It is a monetary technology and either everyone adopts it and uses it as money because money is a winner take all game or eventually it fades into nothingness. So I'm a huge fan of having a small allocation to it because it's an asymmetric bet. But if you want to set your future descendants up for success, simply buying Bitcoin is not the way to do it. First, learn how to create value, learn how to create assets, learn to be an entrepreneur, build a business, grow a company, and then teach 
your children and your grandchildren how to do the same. Because at the end of the day, it is the skills to create things that other people want badly enough that they'll pay you for it. That is the only thing that will preserve wealth throughout time. It is not the assets that you buy that can get taken away from you. It is not the cryptocurrency you buy that can go to zero. Learn the skills to build the wealth and pass that knowledge on. And if you need any help with that, I've got just the thing for you, Heresy Financial University, where I teach hundreds of members how to make more, keep more with their investments, lose less, create more wealth. We do monthly live streams. You get unlimited access to every single course that I've created. It is the best source of financial education there is. Link is in the description below. It's $99 a month and the price is going up starting in less than two months in 2024. It will never be this price again. So sign up now, lock your price in right now so you don't lose out on $99 a month. As always, thanks so much for watching. Have a great day.